Okay, this is another one of my fun-filled, what would happen if I eat this for 30 days in a row? And today, I'm going to take up kale. Now, kale is one of those controversial foods. Some people love it, some people hate it. My good friend Dave Asprey hates kale. Now, it accumulates thallium more than just about any plant. I've seen it accumulate cadmium as well, another heavy metal. So that's why he hates kale. And for you oxalate haters out there, kale actually has a lot of oxalates. So let's talk about oxalates first. Oxalates are part of the plant defense system against being eaten. And oxalates in people who believe they are sensitive to oxalates can cause pain, can cause kidney stones, can cause kidney damage. And there's even books out there saying that most of the pain that you have in your life are from oxalates. Well, not so fast. Believe it or not, we used to have a beautiful defense system against plant defense compounds like oxalates and like lectins. We have, we used to have lectin-eating bacteria. For instance, there are bacteria that love to eat gluten. And in fact, there are bacteria that love to eat oxalates. When you look at people who are sensitive to oxalates or who actually have calcium oxalate kidney stones, those individuals lack those oxalate eating bacteria. So it's not the oxalates that are the actual problem. The problem, like I write about in all my books, is we lack the defense system against these plant compounds that we used to have, that we could tolerate these plant compounds. And they're part of the seven deadly disruptors that I've written about in the past. And interestingly enough, many of my patients who are oxalate sensitive when they start, once we fix their gut microbiome and once we fix their leaky gut, they can have all the oxalate containing foods that they want. Now, let me tell you an interesting story about kale. All of these plants, particularly the bitter plants like kale, are loaded with compounds to warn their predator, be careful about eating me because you're not going to feel very good after you eat me. And kale happens to be one of those compounds. Interestingly enough, if you look at long-lived people in general, they eat a lot of bitter compounds. And one of my sayings you may know is more bitter, more better. But that bitterness comes at a price. The dose makes the poison, as Pericles was wont to say, and that's true. A little dab will do you. So let me tell you my personal kale story. Years ago, we bought a neutral bullet, and my wife decided that we were going to do kale smoothies. And so she made me a kale smoothie with nothing but kale in it. And I drank my kale smoothie on the way to work. And quite frankly, within a half an hour, I was sitting on the toilet with blowout diarrhea. And I go, what the heck? Well, what had happened was that if I ate kale, it would take hours for that kale to be broken down for my bacteria to digest the cell wall of kale, and I would be exposed little by little to these toxins in kale. Instead, my wife, bless her heart, had broken down every cell wall and exposed me to a massive instantaneous dose of kale toxins. Thanks a lot. We don't do that anymore. Now, the point is, I have obviously a number of people who have IBS, have leaky gut, have intestinal issues. And one of the things I found through the years is that they are very intolerant of dark green leafy vegetables for that very reason. And so for my patients like that, I make them cook 
kale or spinach or broccoli or arugula down to mush. And even then, some of them can't tolerate it. So if you're one of those people with a sensitive stomach, with IBS, with loose bowels, then kale for 30 days is not for you and you will not do well. Now, on the other hand, the cruciferous vegetables in general are great sources of sulfur-containing compounds. And sulfur in our diet is incredibly useful for making another postbiotic called hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is the rotten egg smell. Now, we used to think it was toxic, and it's true. High doses of hydrogen sulfide are very damaging. But we now know that a little dab will do you and that there's a Goldilocks effect of hydrogen sulfide in being very good for your blood vessels, in being very good as an anti-cancer agent, and also being very good for your brain. So I'm a big fan of these cruciferous vegetables in moderate amounts. Now, the third thing that I've noticed in my patients who really go crazy for cruciferous vegetables or kale, which is a cruciferous vegetable, is that some of them, not most of them, but some of them begin to suppress their thyroid function. Now, this is different than Hashimoto's thyroiditis. What we do see in those patients is a gradual rise in one of the markers of thyroid function called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, their levels of free T4 and free T3 remain normal, but their TSH starts creeping up. So when I ask them, are you eating a lot of cruciferous vegetables? Oh, yeah, well, you know, we have cauliflower and cauliflower rice and cauliflower pizza and broccoli, and we have arugula in our salad, and we have cabbage, and we have kimchi. I go, whoa. I think you're eating too much of this. Can we back off before the next blood test and see what happens? And sure enough, in all of those patients, it was their love and thinking of cruciferous vegetables that was actually suppressing their thyroid. So what would happen if you had kale for 30 days in a row? If you've got it, gut issues, you'll find out fairly quickly. If you already suffer from a low thyroid, it's probably not a good idea. You need to find that sweet spot with cruciferous vegetables. Maybe every other day, maybe on the weekends. Experiment. If you really want to find out, get yourself thyroid function tests. They're cheap to do. Eat kale for two months. Repeat your thyroid function tests and see where you are. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. Can you imagine that you could actually improve your brain by eating a lion's mane mushroom? It's true, you can.